Hello, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we also veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. This podcast will be on the Hello Kitty murder. The victim, Fan Man Yi. And while this will be a shorter podcast, it also comes with a huge disclaimer. What happened to this young lady is intense, and there's no soft way to get just how badly she suffered without giving graphic details. So listener discretion and all of that, okay? Okay. So any background information on Fan Man Yi is next to nothing, as far as I could find. We know she was born in or near Hong Kong sometime in 1976. Fan had been abandoned by her family when she was a smaller child and she was raised in a girl's home. Hong Kong back then really had already been going through it. Just before her time, there was a growing United States involvement in the Vietnam War and Hong Kong had been a major stop for American troops seeking, quote, rest and relaxation. There was a growing unease within the country at that time, a growing divide between the rich and the poor, as well as official corruption. The manufacturing industries were pretty much unregulated, meaning laborers were forced to work very long hours under very poor conditions. There was growing political upheaval in China, which was seeping into the colony. Workers wanting better pay and better working conditions began to escalate into street violence. This resulted in major reforms in Hong Kong, including the cleanup of their scandal-ridden police force. But at the same time, China was wanting to make sure Hong Kong knew that they were still considered part of the Chinese territory. Then there was an influx of Chinese immigrants who were crossing over into Hong Kong to get out of China. Everything in Hong Kong started booming and it was established as an Asian tiger or one of the region's economic powerhouses with a thriving economy based on high technology industries. As one might expect, if families didn't have enough money to send both a son and a daughter to school, they would choose to educate their son over their daughter back then. That of course would change not long after Fan was born, but before that there was a tremendous amount of pressure on a woman to produce male offspring, regardless of economic status and education. Women who could not give birth to a male child were unfortunately viewed as defective and were often divorced back then. So there's of course no way to know for sure, but was Fan left in the care of a girl's home simply for being born female? It's a possibility. In the 1990s, Hong Kong was plagued by a sharp increase in the drug trade and gang violence. You see, by 1997, Hong Kong was handed back over to China from being a British colony. Just before that happened, the gangs felt they would use the time they had left of relative freedom to make some major money. A lot of these gangs broke up into what they called triads or a group of three that worked together for gangs. But we'll come back to the triads in a bit. So, as a teen in the 90s, young Fan was already a drug addict and selling her body to pay for her habit. And while I couldn't find specifically what her drug of choice was, it is believed it was most likely methamphetamine. She was also involved in petty crimes. The South China Morning Post stated, quote, Often you find with the young girls that they get attracted to the bad triad guys. They become the girlfriend and then they get involved with drugs and so the cycle goes." In 1997, 21-year-old Fan got a job as a hostess at a pretty popular nightclub. 
although a few other sources say she was working in a very expensive brothel and she was still using drugs and prostituting herself. It was while working at this nightclub or brothel that she met 34-year-old socialite Chan Manlock. The two hit it off immediately because, you know, he was also a drug dealer and a pimp. It didn't take long for Fan to get caught up into Chan's world. I mean, he had the money, the drugs, and the clout that she was attracted to. Chan was a flashy guy, according to associates, and he wore like fake Armani suits and knockoff Rolex watches, and he loved to flaunt his money. He was also a heavy methamphetamine user. At some point fairly early in their relationship, if you even want to call it that, Fan was desperate for some cash. So for whatever reason, most likely from a need for drugs, she stole Chan's wallet, which had the equivalent of about $4,000 in cash inside. So once he discovered the theft, he became furious and he called for his two henchmen, thus he was in a triad, to tell her that she had to repay every cent of that stolen money back plus this enormous amount of interest, and either with cash or with her body. So Fan was then forced to prostitute herself to try to pay it back, and she actually kept up with the payments pretty well at first. Also during this time when she was repaying the debt, she got married, became pregnant, and gave birth to a baby boy, having given up drugs completely when she found out that she was pregnant, according to later testimony from her husband. Of course, one source also said that he was a drug addict himself and abusive toward her. But in defense of Fan, there is a picture of her holding her infant son. I'll probably use it as a thumbnail on the YouTube side. He looks to be around six months old and she looks happy and healthy and so does her son. Both have genuine smiles on their face as the baby sort of points at the camera, wearing a bib and sporting round, happy cheeks. She's looking at her son's face with this genuine and glowing adoration. Her skin looks glowing and healthy. She looks great. The picture gives you the impression that Fan was doing better, and it is obvious that her son was healthy and well taken care of. So by early 1999, the now 23-year-old Fan had paid back all the money she had stolen from Chan, plus an additional $10,000 in interest. Chan, saying that she made good on the money she owed, plus that ridiculous amount of interest, decided to tell her that that wasn't good enough and that he wanted an additional $16,000 in interest. Can you imagine? She had a young son and a husband and bills and responsibilities, and she knew she was not going to be able to come up with that money, but she desperately tried. And, as you can expect, she got behind on the payments. So on March 17, 1999, Chan called on his henchman to kidnap Fan from her apartment and take her to his apartment in an old and dilapidated building located in a rundown area. And strangely enough, Chan's apartment was decorated heavily with Hello Kitty items, such as curtains, sheets, stuffed animals, posters, and so on. Fan was brought in and immediately interrogated as to why she was unable to make the regular payments on the money she owed, to which she tried to explain, and that's when the unimaginable torture began. So here's my famous disclaimer, disclaimer, okay, things are about to get intense. All three men were, at this point, chronically abusing methamphetamine. Now, most of you are very aware of what this drug is and how people act while on it. I live in kind of a, an area of the United States where meth is like this horrific pandemic of its own. But 
For those that might not know, methamphetamine, normally just called meth, is a powerful, highly addictive stimulant drug that affects the central nervous system. It is chemically similar to amphetamine, which is a drug used to treat some disorders, including ADHD. It's very readily obvious if a person actually has ADHD, because once they take this prescribed amphetamine, they calm down, they are able to focus. People that do not have the disorders that this drug helps to treat, they become super active, they have increased wakefulness and physical activity, decreased appetite, faster breathing, rapid or irregular heartbeat, increased blood pressure and body temperature. But the draw of methamphetamine is that people feel invincible, though it can also make them highly agitated. They can experience confusion, memory loss, sleeping problems, anxiety, and then that leads to violent behavior, paranoia, and hallucinations. And if you have ever actually witnessed someone moving and walking around when they're on meth, it's insane to watch. Words do not describe. It's just not good. So the physical abuse started nearly immediately. The men took the time to board up the windows, and then she was kicked over 50 times, most of the blows landing on her head, and that was just the beginning. They all took turns brutally raping her, beating her with metal pipes, and stomping her. They, of course, would take breaks to do more meth, leave the apartment, you know, and go party at nightclubs and whatnot but they always returned to torture her by forcing her to drink boiling oil or melting plastic and pouring it on her skin. They would melt like the end of straws and then burn the bottoms of her feet with it. Or sometimes they just used a lighter. Now, 36 year old Chan was then dating a 13 year old girl who was living in a girl's home herself. She apparently came to the apartment and witnessed the torture of Fan, and she was actually encouraged to take part in it. The girl was told to uh, defecate in a small box that would then be fed to Fan. Fan was also forced to drink the men's urine. They delighted in this torture. They also tied the young mother's wrists together with electrical wire and then suspended her from the ceiling. Then they beat her relentlessly with a metal pipe. It's believed that they either forced her to do meth with them or she did it willingly, but either way, she would not leave her wounds alone, constantly digging at herself. And Fan endured this horrific torture for a whole month. Yes, guys, a month. Towards the end, Fan began to fade in and out of consciousness for a few days. She then mercifully succumbed to her injuries and died. Another theory is that she intentionally took like this massive overdose of meth to commit suicide, which if that were true, I mean, who could blame her? The men then let her body rot for, you know, a few days because they were so hopped up on drugs and busy with video games. But the smell, I would assume, became overwhelming because the men finally decided her corpse would need to be disposed of. So they picked her body up, put it in the bathtub, tried to drain the blood out of her body, then began dismembering her with a saw. They then collected her various body parts, boiled them in water, and by the way, alongside their own food they were cooking where utensils used for cooking food were shared with human remains boiling in another pot. Yes, family, yes. They then put the leftover remains into bags and tossed them in the outside trash but they also managed to leave a small amount out of the internal organs on the small balcony and inside the apartment as well that they missed. 
Then they took her head. They cooked it in a gasoline stove and shoved the skull inside of a mermaid Hello Kitty stuffed animal, sewing it back shut. Oh, the neighbors, you ask? Well, they contacted the police, of course, stating there was a horrible smell coming from the apartment, but their complaints were ignored due to the police believing that it was due to a buildup of trash outside of the building. So in May of 1999, this is two months after she'd been kidnapped, a social worker that was working in a teen girl's reformatory school filled out a police report about a murder that a 13-year-old girl under her care had told her had happened. This teen girl, who was the girl that helped torture Fan, of course, stated she was having nightmares every night about a woman who was begging her to find her missing head. After further questioning, the girl admitted that she had actually witnessed the torture and murder and dismemberment of a woman and that she was the girlfriend of one of the torturers. Soon after, the authorities had the teen take them to the apartment where they gained entry and they were immediately met with the overwhelming smell of rot and decay. It was so strong that it was said that it made one of the officers nearly sick, like it made his eyes water. Laying in a hallway in the apartment as they entered was the Hello Kitty doll. An officer took a metal rod and gently poked the doll, only to confirm that something hard was definitely inside of it. A medical examiner was called to the scene and he opened the doll and found the skull inside along with maggots all in the cotton stuffing. They also seized a small fridge, a hammer, and a set of pots used to cook the woman's remains. There were still a tiny bit of remains inside, actually. So the teen girl gave the names of the men that had tortured, murdered, and dismembered Fan to the police. Chan was arrested the next day one of the henchmen turned himself in and the third did attempt to flee the country and he made it into China, but he was caught in February of the next year when he was trying to return back into Hong Kong. In October of 2000, the trial began and all three pled not guilty of Fan's murder. And it did prove difficult to get a very solid murder case against the men because there really wasn't much left of Fan for evidence, just the skull and a small bit of tissue. The medical examiner wasn't able to actually determine the cause of death. So in December of 2000, the jury found all three men guilty of manslaughter instead of murder, and each was sentenced to life in prison with a chance at parole after 25 years. All three men showed no lack of remorse and the judge noted that they most likely would not repent their crime. The judge actually said, quote, never throughout the years in Hong Kong has a court heard such cruelty, depravity, callousness, brutality, violence, and viciousness perpetrated by a human being or human beings on another human being. Even an animal would not have been maltreated in the same way as that received by the deceased." Unquote. The jury accepted the three men did not deliberately murder Fan, but that her death had been the result of their abuse. All three, of course, appealed, but the henchman that turned himself in was the only one who was successful in getting his sentence reduced to just 18 years. And guess what, folks? He was released in April of 2014. The people who lived in the building complained that it was haunted because over there, you know, superstitions and things are different. They stated they could hear a woman crying. The owner of the building, for obvious reasons, had a hard time renting the apartments out after this, even after lowering the rent drastically. But finally, a hair salon bought out the first two floors of the building, 
but then the employees of the salon also reported hauntings. In 2012, the building was demolished and rebuilt as a hotel. The skull was kept in the morgue as a key piece of evidence, but was eventually given to some relatives of fans in March of 2004. Thanks for listening.